So how did eugenics end? Was it the mainstream scientific community that put a stop to this madness? In fact, it was the so-called mainstream scientists that were promoting eugenics as good science. Instead of the scientific establishment, the strongest opposition to eugenics came from conservative religious groups. Roman Catholics probably provided the most consistent opposition from religious groups. Pope Pius XI strongly condemned forced sterilization in an encyclical in 1930, criticizing eugenists for calling on the civil authority to arrogate to itself a power over a faculty which it never had and can never legitimately possess. Evangelical firebrands William Jennings Bryan and Billy Sunday both condemned eugenics, with Bryan dismissing it as a program for scientific breeding under which a few supposedly superior intellects, self-appointed, would direct the mating and the movements of the mass of mankind. By 1930s, some mainstream evolutionary biologists started to make very limited criticisms of eugenics, but most still supported negative eugenics and forced sterilization. And into the early 1940s, a group calling itself the Human Betterment Foundation in California was still sending out more than 100,000 pro-sterilization leaflets for use in college biology and physical education classes around the nation. In the end, it was probably the Nazis who finally caused many people to reconsider the wisdom of the eugenics crusade. In the name of eugenics, the Nazis didn't just sterilize people, they killed them. As the enormity of the Nazi crimes in the name of negative eugenics became clear, many Americans, including those in the medical and scientific communities, recoiled. The additional post-war revelations about Nazi genocide of the Jews effectively killed off old-style eugenics as a mainstream movement, although some true believers continued to propagate the faith after the war. George Santayana famously said that those who cannot learn from history are doomed to repeat it. So what are the lessons we should learn from the eugenics crusade? Was eugenics simply an example of how politicians can hijack science for their own ends? That's what some Darwinists would have you believe. Yet the leaders of eugenics were largely university-trained biologists and doctors, not politicians and they pushed for eugenics because they thought it was fully justified by biological science. Eugenics is a branch of biology, social biology, and its study has been cultivated chiefly by the biologists, insisted biologist Charles Davenport. The biologist demands cures instead of first aid, added Harvard's Edward East, who condemned most social service programs as unsound biologically and justified eugenic birth control as the appropriate scientific alternative. Maybe eugenics should be held as an example of the dangers of fringe science. Actually, eugenics represented mainstream science, not the fringe. Eugenists were affiliated with institutions like Harvard, Princeton, Columbia, and Stanford. They were leaders in America's most prestigious scientific organizations like the National Academy of Sciences and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Paleontologist Henry Fairfield Osborne was director of the American Museum of Natural History in New York, which sponsored an extensive exhibit promoting eugenics during the Third International Congress of Eugenics. In sum, the leading eugenists were members of the scientific establishment, and their views became so dominant for a time that eugenics was, for all practical purposes, the consensus view of the scientific community in America for decades. Indeed, eugenics exposes the danger of simply trusting the current scientific consensus. Because it can be wrong. Perhaps eugenics should be regarded as an example of science reforming itself through the scientific method. Then again, maybe not. There were a handful of mainstream biologists who raised criticisms of eugenics, but usually even they supported the public policies of forced sterilization of the feeble-minded. The most consistent critics of eugenics were Roman Catholics and Protestant fundamentalists. 
If anything, eugenics highlights the value and importance of even non-scientists in raising questions and participating in the public debate over science and public policy. The real lesson of eugenics is the danger of allowing scientists to rule simply because of their superior scientific expertise. Historically speaking, the eugenics movement is important because it was one of the first efforts to try to expand the power of scientists over the rest of society. Eugenists claimed that their superior scientific knowledge trumped the beliefs of non-scientists, and so they should be allowed to design a truly scientific welfare policy. Critics of eugenics disputed this claim early on, pointing out that good public policy requires a knowledge broader than just scientific expertise. When Pennsylvania's governor, Samuel Pennypacker, vetoed a forced sterilization proposal in 1905, for example, he announced, Scientists, like all other men whose experiences have been limited to one pursuit, sometimes need to be restrained. Men of high scientific attainments are prone, in their love for technique, to lose sight of broad principles outside their domain of thought. Eugenics remains a tainted word, and in recent years, a number of states, including California and Virginia, have issued apologies for their forced sterilization programs. But while government-imposed eugenics may no longer be popular, the eugenist's underlying claim that scientists should rule because of their scientific expertise is more deeply ingrained in the American political psyche than ever. Whether the issue is stem cell research, global warming, teaching about evolution, or something else, some are trying to claim that it represents a war on science for anyone to challenge the current scientific consensus when it comes to public policy. In fact, it's a defense of good science to allow open debate and discussion about current scientific views genuine science thrives on free inquiry. In coming decades, as the powers of science continue to grow apace with new discoveries in genetics, neuroscience, and computers, we would be well advised to remember the historical dangers of allowing those who claim to speak in the name of science full reign to dictate public policy. We'd also do well to remember the critical importance of allowing all citizens to raise questions and dispute public policy claims made in the name of science. If you would like more information on the history of eugenics in America, I'd encourage you to read my new book, Darwin Day in America. You can visit the book's website at www.darwindayinamerica.com. That's darwindayinamerica.com. For ID the Future... This is John West. Music on ID the Future comes courtesy of composer Yuri Momchur. Visit www.yuriproductions.com and check out his latest CD, In the Harbor. This program was recorded by Discovery Institute's Center for Science and Culture. Discovery president is Bruce Chapman. ID the Future managing editor is Robert Crowther. And the producer is Keith Bennett. ID the Future and ID Science in the News is copyright Discovery Institute 2006. For more information, visit www.discovery.org or www.idthefuture.com.